What allows me to sell in the way that I sell myself is by talking about my shortcomings. People want to know that you're human, just like them. So when I talk about my bankruptcy, when I talk about my pops, when I talk about my repossessions, when I talk about the apartment, people resonate with that. They're like, damn, Bricard, like that's what I'm going through. Welcome back, everybody. It's another episode of the Credit Repair Junkies podcast. Today, we have a banger for you guys. I have no one other than Ricardo Soto from the Financial ER joining me today. If you don't know this man by now, trust me, you want to know him. Ricardo, thank you so much for being part of this podcast episode. I'm so excited to have this conversation with you today, brother. Bro, thank you, man, Bruce. I think uh, it's it's like the honor is all mine, man, for sure. It's like... Dude, like I, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm actually gonna be like, you owe me after this, so I can cash in and ask you a bunch of things, man. No problem, man. Thank you, thank you for agreeing to to do this. I know your your time is very valuable, so I appreciate you coming on here and having this conversation with me. Let's jump in. I just want to get to know a little bit more about about your story, man. Like you're, you've been in the credit repair industry for for how long now? So I've been officially in the credit repair industry for four years now. Uh, filed an LLC and everything got started for four years, but um, I've been in the credit space and I don't want to say credit repair space but I've been in the credit space since like about 2010 since I started working for banks and stuff like that I used to work for Chase I used to work for Wells Fargo my last corporate job was Chase Bank I was an assistant manager till I got promoted to customer right so yeah we don't we don't say the word fired we got we got promoted to customer man that's funny <laughs> but uh yeah man it's it's been a it's been a minute since I've been around credit and it, you know it's funny um Quick story, when when you're working at the bank, for any of the viewers that work at the bank and attest to this, they don't teach us anything about credit in the banking industry. They teach us how to sell credit products, which is completely different. I can sell the hell out of a credit card, right? But when people tell me, well, how do I use the credit card? I, I don't know. Yeah, it's just for the bank's benefit only, right? Never to the, to the consumer's benefit. Right, yeah. It's interesting, you know, covering all your covering the rear ends in regards of like what you can say, what you cannot say and stuff like that, you know. I remember even in my first credit card that I got with Bank of America, I think the only thing that I was told by the bank was like, oh, just make sure you don't use more than 30%. percent hey, you will be good, right? And then come to find out later when I actually know about credit, I was like, oh, that's that's just crap advice, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, man. For sure. How long were you in the banking industry? Well, I worked first for Wells Fargo as a teller for like a year. And then Chase came into California. I'm in Southern California. So Chase came into California. And then uh, I think like a couple years into into them being here, I switched over. My manager switched over. He took his bankers. He took uh, uh, most of the tellers and everything from that one branch. And I was one of them. So I worked for Chase about seven years. And then that's kind of like uh, where my corporate career ended, if you will. Uh, long story short. My in 2015, my dad was diagnosed with a brain tumor, and then um, after just financial spirals of him being in the in the hospital and just having complications from the medications and whatnot, before you know it, it was uh, like, hey, I need to spend time in the hospital. I got fired, right? I got fired from the bank. That's how I got promoted to customer because I was spending too much time out of work uh, because of that family emergency. And I was that one family member that was like, hey, anything that's needed for my dad, like let's put it on my credit cards, right? And then it's one of those things where like, you don't know what you're doing financially speaking. And then before I, I knew it, I was like, oh crap, like I have over $100,000 in credit card debt. How did I get here? Because I wasn't paying for my credit cards. I couldn't pay for my auto loan, for my wife's auto loan. So we got our cars repossessed. We got our credit cards charged off. And then fast forward to 2018, I filed for a chapter seven bankruptcy. So it's funny when I talk to people in regards of like their credit and they're like, oh, Ricardo, don't laugh on my credit. I'm like, uh, you can't top mine. <laughs> yeah, I was in that 113 Gs and a bankruptcy. So I've, I've seen worse than yours. Yeah, man. So I guess you 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 got fired or from the bank, you got promoted to customer from, That's right. from the bank because you had this family emergency. I mean, I can imagine dealing with what you were dealing with have your family member, especially your dad, diagnosed with something like that. And you had to literally choose, I guess, between being there with your family, with your dad, or or being there in your J-O-B, right? You said, screw you, J-O-B. I got to be here for my family. And you had good credit. You had good credit. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we, we at, at the time when this all happened, the complications really happened in 2015. But ever since 2014, he was diagnosed, right? We had just bought a house at the end of 2012, brand new home in Southern California, back when the prices were 
very, very good. And the interest rates are very nice. Bro, we got a brand new house for $200,000, right? They begged us to buy the house, by the way. They were, it was the last model home that they had in the community, right? And it was like, we'll, we'll leave all the, all the, the fridge. We'll leave all the electronics, like everything, right? The furniture, like just, just buy it. We just want to be done with this community and move on, right? That's what the builder wants. We took advantage of that, right? And then I got fearful of not having income coming in. And I made the one single biggest mistake that I could make, which is take our home from my family. I said, we're going to sell this because I, I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. So we, we paid off some of our debt with that, you know, with the income that we had from the, from those gains. But here, here's something that I've never said anywhere before. I always paint this picture of myself where like, yeah, I got, I got promoted to customer. I got fired from the bank because, you know, I was there for my dad, but I've never talked about the relationship that I had with my dad. It wasn't a very good one. And I felt guilty. And the only thing that I can do was to say, you know what? I'm going to be here for my dad. And, and, and that's, that's, that's the way of me saying, I'm sorry to you for, for not having a good relationship with you when he wasn't there anymore. He was just, you know, in bed and he, he couldn't function anymore. I wanted to get fired, bro, because that's, that was my way of repaying back my dad in a way, you know, of like that. I mean, you, you don't know what you're doing. You're going through, through so many emotions and whatnot. I don't want to sound like a victim here because I wasn't. It's not a guilt trip, right? Like I'm sure that it wasn't about that. It was about recognizing that there's some things that matter more than other things, right? Like this mattered more than whatever type of relationship you and your father had. Like this was one of those things that trumps all of that, right? So you made this decision. So you know what? I don't care what it's going to take. I need to do this because I'm going to regret it if I don't, right? You know, you know, when you're going through a, a financial spiral, when you're going through a health spiral, when you're going through all the things that we were going through at the time, your thinking isn't quite clear the way that you you said it. Yeah, that's kind of like the main idea. Or you're just trying to function on a day to day basis. You know, you you don't know what you got going on. I had a two year old. I had no money coming in. My dad in the hospital. My wife asking like, "What do you think we're gonna do?" Every day we were driving nearly two hours to visit my dad because every day he woke up was, "Hey, he made it today. We gotta go see him." So it wasn't like a clear vision of like what was going on. But one thing I can tell you for sure, man, was that um, because I was the only Spanish or English speaking family member, and then the doctor was Asian, and um, you know all the communication was just English, right? The crazy part, Bruce, is that there was one point where we were at the hospital, my dad was about to go in to get his brain tumor removed, but he wasn't there anymore. The doctor said, hey, look, we can go through the operation. It's normally an eight hour procedure, but based on your dad's condition, it's gonna be about a 16 hour process. He's prone to more blood loss than normal. And the chances of him ending at that table are very high. Do you want me to proceed with the surgery? And it came down to me. And there was this moment, bro, where it was like, I had to look at the relationship that I had with my dad and I'm like, what do I say? You know, like in, in the relationship wasn't very good. And it's like, what do I say? Like, do I, there was even a moment of like, do I care about what happens next? And, and it's such a terrible feeling, Bruce, you know? And my brother said, let's not do it. And I was like, all right, let's not do it. You know, that was the best decision. Like everything happens for a reason. Everything happens the way it's supposed to happen. But yeah, man, all, all during that time, like, you know, the, the credit was the last thing that I could think of. You know, people don't wake up and say, you know what? I feel like having the world's crappiest credit today. I want to make my life as hard, my life as hard as possible, right? Okay. <laughs> you know, yeah. something happens that makes your credit go south. And and that that's that's where my credit went south, man. That's where the $113,000 in charged off debt and bankruptcy comes from. And then I'm assuming that, you know, moving on from, from that experience, like, because that's your story, right? That's how you got kind of into this whole credit world in the first place. How did you get into credit repair? Like, what was that transition like and why credit repair? Well, for the, for the people that are wondering like, hey, um, what's going on with your dad? Like, my dad is alive and well today. He's the world's happiest Uber driver. Um, awesome. So I, yeah. So I was actually telling him, I'm like, hey, dad, because he went to pick me up from the airport, right? So we have, a, we, have a Turo, we have a car on Turo and he picked me up from the airport this morning and went to drop it off. And I was like, hey, dad. I'm going to, I'm going to make you a little, like my story card that you can put like a little booklet in the back of your car. So people can actually know 
you know, what, what you've been through and, you know, just to give them that more personal experience and connection with them. I was going to ask, but I felt bad. Like, man, I don't know if I should ask him what happened to his dad. Cause I don't want to go down, like, you know, bringing emotions. Else, but I'm glad that you brought it up. Um, that's awesome, dude. Happy to hear that. So he had to have an emergency surgery at the ER when we first found out about the brain tumor and stuff like that. And it had nothing to do with a brain tumor. It was another complication. Uh, he had diverticulitis. That's a life and death situation type of deal. Emergency surgery, he survived. A week later, his intestine ruptures. Another emergency surgery. A year later, I find the doctor that did both surgeries at Target. I bumped to him, right? And I was like, oh my God, Dr. Lifshitz, how are you? I'm like, oh, just let you know my dad's alive and well. He's like, really? I don't think you're surprised to hear that. He, he said, I didn't think he was going to make it. Wow. Bro, for a doctor to tell you that, that's nuts, you know? That is nuts. But yeah, yeah it, it, that's he, strong, man. He's he's around for a reason. He's got the will to live, man. He's got a will to go around, you know. And I love that, you know. Fast forward, he when all this happened, we hadn't had our second uh, born yet, and then uh, now, you know, he's around the picture. He loves his grandkids. He's got a very very strong reason to live for. But going back to your question, how did I get into the whole credit space? Um, one time, I was taking my son to preschool, and I saw one of the dads there. He was dressed all nice, right, with a uh, sports jacket on and everything, and he had a a name tag from a dealership. It's like, oh, bro, I love that dealership. I'm like, I drive by there all the time. You guys have the the, the coolest cars ever. Man, I wish I could get a, a car, but you know what? Like my credit is trash. I, I filed for bankruptcy. And then he said the magical words that changed my life forever. He goes, oh, I can help you with that. <laughs> and I thought he was actually talking about like hooking it up with a loan, getting me approved, right? He goes, I do credit repair. And I was like, credit repair, what's that? He briefly explained some BS to me of what credit repair was and what he does. And I was like, well, sign me up and sign my wife up. Like, how do we do this? Right. So then that's kind of like how my journey began. And, I, and I'm a huge geek. I'm a huge nerd of like, what are the processes of everything? How does it work? Right. I'm basically the nightmare client for every credit repair company. You know what I mean? So then I was like, hey, so how does this work? How do you do it? And after him explaining something that didn't really make sense to me, I was like, well, let me read a little bit about it, right? And so then I went down to this rabbit hole of how credit repair works and how things are yeah. deleted. And I didn't understand it, but I thought I did. And I was like, you know what? Let me take over my process and my wife's process of credit repair. And then that's how I found out the do's and don'ts. So yeah, that's that's kind of like how I got into the into the credit repair space. So you got, you got bad credit because you're trying to be, you know, like, provider for for your family, for for your dad, for everything that was happening. And then now it's like, hey, I'm ready. Everything's good. I'm ready to kind of get back on track with this whole thing. Hired a credit repair company and then got curious enough to be like, you know what? Let me just figure out how to do this myself. And boom, you and your wife are your first clients. Yeah, yeah exactly, man. Bro, man. Like, I remember um, you know, prior to me getting fired and when everything was happening with my dad, we were like really into like holistic healing and whatnot. And my brother was like, oh my gosh, I found this shaman like out in the middle of the jungle and we, we need to buy a flight for my dad and this and that, right? And I was like, okay, let me get a credit card so I can put it all on my credit. Like, that's how, like, that's where my mindset was at at the time where it's like, let me just put the, like, we don't have the money to pay for these things, but let me get into debt so we could try to help out. Again, that little guilt of like, this is my way of trying to contribute towards my dad's health. And I wasn't thinking of like, oh, like dealing with the debt ahead. Like that was nowhere in sight. And it, honestly, for most consumers, it's not, you know? People just simply get into debt. But yeah, that was basically in a nutshell how I got into the credit industry. And um, I remember the guy that signed me up for credit repair. Like I had a little fallout with him, right? But prior to my fallout with him, he was like, oh, I just came out with my course. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. Like you teach how to repair credit. Like let me buy you a course. He's like, yeah, it's only $50 and I teach you from A through Z, right? And I was like, oh my God, $50 has got to be jam packed with value, right? And it's, it was nothing more. Are, are we allowed to say like CRC in the podcast? Yeah, sure. yeah. Yeah. So it was nothing more than him screen recording his computer through CRC, showing me how to click dispute reason and instruction. And that was Shut, it. That was it. $50. That was, that was the course. Yeah. That was the course. Right. And I was like, oh my gosh. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, that's how I got introduced to CRC, by the way, and stuff like that, you know? I mean, that's normally how, how people find it. Even what anybody that searches anything with credit repair related, you know, they come up, right? So they do a great job at um, teaching people kind of the what it is, right? Here's what credit repair is and here's a tool and it's great. So you came in, 
you decided to take matters into your own hands. So you didn't intentionally start a credit repair company. You're like, I just want to fix my old credit. So then yeah. when, what, when was the aha moment? I was like, huh, maybe I should do this as a business. Yeah. So um, during this whole transition, I, I, I've been a musician. Well, I was a musician. I was a touring musician for about 15 years, man. Played all over the US, went tours in Mexico. But it's, it's not a cool lifestyle when you have kids, you know? I was having little jobs here and there. My wife and I started a media company. She's a photographer. I was doing videography. I learned how to record. And I was shooting music videos, you know? And then I started shooting car commercials and it was all kinds of crazy things. We were in a very entrepreneurial journey. You know, we went through MLM, you know, we were part of Amway for a little bit, which kind of got us kickstarted on reading and, and self-education and whatnot. And then, um, and I got employed by the dealership for doing sales. And it's funny because, uh, they were like, yeah, we need help with marketing. And I I always said, I don't want to be the person responsible for bringing leads in. That's too much of a heavy weight in my plate. Ironically, that's all I do for my company now. Right. <laughs> yeah. So then I started doing car sales. They're like, hey, now we need help with online sales. And it's like, okay, I started doing car sales at a used uh, dealership. And I noticed that like 99.99999% of the people that came in had terrible credit. And I only knew like maybe basic things here and there. And I was like, okay, like if you were to do this, like your credit would improve and then the bank would actually allow you to get approved. They're like, oh, okay. And then, so my wife was like, Hey, you know what? You should start doing some videos. Right. And I was like, okay. I started doing it uh, in Instagram first and she goes, why don't you try TikTok? And I was like, sure. And then I tried TikTok and then like, that's when it hit. Yeah. And then, so you got into the TikTok um, to try to get leads in, not knowing what was going to happen. This was before you had like a full blown credit repair business and I would just find a way to grow it. <laughs> so prior to TikTok, I started getting my LLC. And, and the funny part was like, you know, when you dream, when you have these goals and quote unquote ambitions, sometimes they, they're smaller than what they could truly be. So my ambition at the time was like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to open up a, a little office right next to this used dealership. And man, they're going to be my bread and butter. You know, everybody that comes in, they're going to come through my office and, you know, I'm going to fix them up and whatnot. Right. And the plan was first, uh, I, I signed the lease for three months with the dealership owner and I'm like, Hey, I'm going to work right here in this office. You know, I gave him three months in advance. Right. So we saved up a lot of money for this. And then, uh, I was like, I'm going to do this after I get off of work from the dealership. Right. And then my wife and I had a talk and we we're like, Hey, why don't we go all in? Why don't we just burn our bridges and go full time? Like, what if we actually make this work, right? So it's it's not like looking at the statistics of like, well, you know, 90% of the businesses, you know, die in the first year. Nine. No, no, I've never been a statistics person. I'm, I've been a what if person. What if it actually works? And and that's what the entrepreneurial mindset is all about, right? Like that's what, you know, what what if there's that 1% chance that you can actually make it happen? So I told, I told the dealership owner, I was like, hey man, you know what? I'm going to quit the job. I'm gonna give you 30 days in a notice in advance. So you can find an internet yeah. guy. But, yeah. but I'm gonna quit and I'm gonna do this full time. You know what crazy part was, Bruce? At the end of the day, bro, he said, Hey, come here to my office real quick. I'm like, all right. The check that I had given him and the contract that I signed for the lease, he ripped it right in front of me. Really? And he goes, If I'm losing you, I'm not giving you this office. And I remember driving home, bro. That was a that was a turning point for me in my life. I remember because I don't, I don't know if you have you ever worked at a dealership. No, dealership have the highest divorce rates. Just letting you know, really, because people spend there all day working. That is true. I actually, yeah, I can see why that's true. And I remember I would have these argue not arguments, but these conversations with my wife. I'm like, hey, like you said, you were gonna be home like at four. It's seven o'clock. I'm like, babe, I'm I'm trying to sell a car and trying to make some money, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And it wasn't like a normal like, job. It's like, dude, like if you're not selling a car, you ain't making money that day. That's <laughs> true. So I got to make this day worth it. So I remember, bro, like I was supposed to be home by five that day when that happened. It was seven o'clock and I was driving home and the accountant called me and the accountant was trying to make me feel guilty to say, you know what? I'll, all right, I'll stay. He's like, you know, I'll never do something like the, the, what you did because I'm loyal, Right. And I remember my wife called me right now and I was crying. I was crying. I was just all these emotions running through of everything that happened and trying to process everything. And my wife, I, you know, I answered my, the phone and my wife was like, oh my gosh, what's wrong? And I, I couldn't use, I was like, <laughs> let, me, let me call you right back. You know? Yeah. And she was yeah. just scared, freaked out. Yeah. And I, and I get home 
And I told her, this is what happened. We're going all in. Like, that's it. She's like, okay. Sink or swim. Yeah, sink or swim, bro. Let's do it. That's probably one of the the biggest blessings in disguise that you've ever had. Um, I'm not saying that everybody needs to get find themselves in a sink or swim position to succeed. But from the conversations that I've had, including my story, if it wasn't for a sink or swim situation, I probably wouldn't be here today, right? Because you have no choice but to succeed when your back is put up against the wall. So sometimes when crap happens and it does, how do you make the most out of that situation, right? And I guess, again, I'm not saying that you have to be in, in a bad situation in order to be successful, but I've rarely found somebody that was in a bad situation and have no other option but to succeed, fail. Like I've, it's very hard. Like I, I haven't found someone that was like that yet. Um, so your story is like you found yourself there. Like you got, you know, your wife, you tell your wife, hey, I just, this is it. We got to go all in. What was her feelings? Like, what, what did she say? I get a little emotional when I talk about her. Um, I do too. Don't worry. <laughs> we about to grow, man. I'll start crying on this podcast. <laughs> there, was, <laughs> there was a time, and this all was happening during COVID. There was a time where when we were first getting into the credit industry, into the credit repair industry, where she was like, you know what, Ricardo, like, I love you, but everything is closed here. Like we, we were living in a 700 square foot apartment with my mom, my wife, myself, and my two kids. And the, the playground was running from one side of the apartment to the other. And there's no parks open, right? Nothing. Like we couldn't do anything. She's like, I love you, but I can't have my kids like running around from one side of the wall to the other. Like I'm going to take them to my mom's house. You know, like our credit in the beginning was just terrible. I hadn't fixed anything yet. Like I was just barely getting into the motion of how this all worked. Yeah. And I was like, dude, like, you know, sink or swim. I got to, I got to make this work. Not only the business, but our credit as well, you know? And it's, it's crazy that that happened because that's one of my, like, I didn't feel proud. It wasn't a proud moment. It was like, oh shoot. Like everything I've done over the last two to three years, every financial decision that I've made has led us to this moment. If I want my life to change, I have to change. Yeah. There's so many parts of, of, of your story, you know, that, that created that turning point, but you know, that happened. And then the whole dealership thing happened. It was one of those things where like, when we had this conversation, when I came home, she's like, okay, let's go all in. By the way, the next 30 days at the dealership were the most like hardest because it was just so uncomfortable, you know, like this just happened. This guy just tried to guilt me into staying. And it's just like, oh man, you know? And they're like, everybody was like, okay, so how do you do this? How do you do Facebook ads? How do you do this, this and that? You know what I mean? And it's like, it's kind of like teaching and it's like, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is how you do it. And I left on a good note, man. I left on a good note, but it was, here's the interesting part. Okay. When you overcome all those things, man, those people that kicked you when you were down, come around. They do. <laughs> Not only did that accountant ask me for a job, but also the owner of the dealership came to me and this was recent, maybe eight months ago. He's like, Hey, I want to know how we can create a partnership and how I can now create my credit repair company and, and start helping people with their credit. Right. What did you say? You know, it was one of those things where the emotion was gone. The, it, there was no hate or anything in the heart. So I was like, yeah, man, um, let's do it. Um, I mean, that was eight months ago. I, I haven't gone around to going to actually set them up yet, you know, but <laughs> yeah. I'll get to it. I'll get, get to it. There. You'll get to it eventually. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I haven't had other priorities so far. I know that, um, you know, you're talking about being that 700 square foot apartment with your wife, the two kids, your mom, yourself, like all these people in this tiny little apartment. And I can only imagine how difficult it was to hear your wife say, Hey, can't do this. I got to go. Like, I need to go. Like, COVID is here. Like, I can't take the kids out anywhere. Like, like they need a bigger space. And not as an ego thing, but as men, right? Like for the men who are listening, we have this provider in, in that's in it. It's, it, it, it. it lives within us, right? So it's not because I'm proud and I'm egotistic, but as a man, like I have, I feel the responsibility of providing for my family. And whenever my family seeks provision somewhere else where I can't provide it, dude, that hurts. Like that, that's like a shot to the heart, not a shot to the ego. It's a shot to the heart. So I'm sure that you felt that in some sort of way, because for me, like in my story, it wasn't 
hey, you know, I can't provide. My story was we've been married for two months and we're sitting on the couch. So I'm saying, hey, babe, let's file bankruptcy because as the way things are going right now, things just aren't working and we'll have a fresh start seven years from now. Like that was hard too, you know? And the support was, no, like we can, we can figure out a way out of this, right? Like let's, let's pray. Let's put God first. Let's see, you know, let's let him deal with the situation. And I'm sure we'll get out of it. And thankfully we didn't have to go down that road, but having to sit my wife down and say, Hey, I think the best thing for us to do is file bankruptcy. That hurt, you know, and that, that was like back against the wall moment. And it's like, no, let me surrender all this to God and hear what the big man upstairs is going to guide us to do. And let's just do what he says. And that was our, our way out. But for you, like to hear that from your wife and say, Hey, you got to take my kiss to my mom's like, yeah, well, what, what was that about? You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I totally get you, man. It's not from the egotistical standpoint. It's, it's from the animal instinct that we have as like, dude, like I am the provider, but I am not providing right now. You know what I mean? And it wasn't about like, oh, we need a bigger space. It was just like, we need sanity for our children. You know, my wife wasn't thinking about herself. She was thinking about the kids. Of course. You know, it was just all about them. And it was just like, oh, like, you know, it's funny that you asked me, like, how did it feel? Like when, when I tell you that, you know, I, I do, you know, me, I do TikTok lives every day, Monday through Friday. My mission is to educate, you know, people in regards of credit and whatnot. I tell people, you think I fix my credit for these? You think I got it? Like, so I went through this whole journey for like high credit limits or be able to get approved for a loan. I did it for them. And then I, I usually put a picture of my family up when I talk about this. I'm like, they're the reason why. I'm like, if you have materialistic things in mind, oh, I want to fix my credit or I want to start a credit repair business because I want to buy a house. You're not, it's not going to motivate you. You know, you really have to dig deeper. You really have to dig deeper and understand based on my financial decisions, who is hurting. I'm glad you brought that up, right? So let's switch gears for a second. Like we talked about, you know, the the dark side of your story into credit repair. Let's fast forward to where we're now. Like this dude, like Ricardo has over 400, like 400,000 followers on TikTok. That's a lot of people, 400,000 people following you, consuming your education, right? So it's fair to say that your company blew up, right? I mean, you got 400,000 followers, you got thousands of clients. What was that journey? Your wife said, oh, try TikTok. So then you tried TikTok. And from that to where you are now, what? why did you just double down on TikTok and what do you do? So I remember when she said, hey, try TikTok. I was like, sure, I'll try it. You know, I've never been shy of the camera or anything like that. And even for the people that are shy, like, they have just as much of a shot as I do, you know, because um, it's not about shyness. Like people don't care about your shyness. They care about what are you going to provide for me? What's going on in this video for me? People are selfish, right? So they don't care about how shy you are. So the second video that I created got some traction, got over a million views, right? And then from there, and then from there it was like, okay, I need to develop something. I was already in CRC at the time. I, you know. And then it was like, hey, I need to get some type of Calendly. People were asking me for help. And I had to set up some some things already like Calendly, you know. And it's like, okay, like I'm getting like, bro, I remember I would open my TikTok and be like 300 new followers. Close. I was like, crazy. close it. 10 seconds later, 150 new followers. Close the app. 20 seconds later, 350 new followers. It got crazy like that for a little bit, right? Now, some people might say, you caught the wave. You got the wave early on. I could tell you, man, it wasn't about the wave. It was about taking the opportunity in and actually implementing and doing the work. The waves come and go for any business. People might think like, oh, I missed the wave. Oh, it's harder on TikTok. It's always been up and down. It's always been like that. You know, my story just happened to catch a high wave and then go to a low wave, a high wave, so on and so forth. But the reason why I decided to double down on, on short form content, it wasn't just TikTok, but it was just like, you know what? I'm going to master short form content. It was because I understood that people want to consume content and they're going to consume either entertainment or value. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to focus on value, how to deliver the best value possible and attract leads, attract leads, attract leads. That's how I grew my business. So that's why I decided to double down on TikTok. And then from TikTok, I just took all my videos and then I uploaded them elsewhere. YouTube shorts, uh, Instagram, Pinterest, Facebook reels, 
And then before I knew it, there was this whole community of people learning from Ricardo. You know, it was your consistency, right? Because you said you may have caught the wave when you started, but that doesn't mean that the wave is still going. Like when the wave went down and things weren't as hype as it was when you first got started, what did you do? You stayed consistent. You stayed consistent and you kept up with it until another wave came along. And then guess what? Because of your consistency, you were there to ride that other wave again. And by now, I'm sure you've gone on many rides on many different waves, but when, when the sea is flat, what are you doing? You're staying consistent. You're still grinding. You're still doing the things that got you to where you were in the first place and not try to rethink strategy. Oh, now I'm going to abandon this. I'm going to try something else. Consistency is key. And you're like, you, you benefit from the fruit of that consistency. What helped you stay consistent when times were down? I understood early on that this is the way, this is one way I should say to attract clientele. And I never explored anything else. You know, when I heard you speak on stage and I heard you, hey, this is how I build my business. This is how I get leads in continuously. And we sign up people. I'm like, wow, like Bruce has something I've never explored before, you know, and you're consistent at that. That's how you build your business, right? Yeah. I'm just happy to be consistent at something else, you know, which is just content creation. Like that there's, if, if people are wondering, well, you know, how do I say consistent? It's like, well, you eat consistently. You go to the bathroom consistently. This is just another thing that you have to do in order. You go to work consistently, you know, if you don't consistently pay your bills, they shut down your electricity at home. It's just, it's second nature type of deal, you know? Yeah. And for those who struggle with consistency, um, have you read Atomic Habits? You know, I, I started to the 1%, right? Every day become better. Yeah. 1%. Yeah. Yeah. Atomic Habits is a book that I'd highly recommend anyone who struggles with consistency or just wants to not only create new habits, but give up bad habits. Like that book, Atomic Habits is, is a bestseller for a reason. Like it, it's a, it, it's a really strong book when it comes to mindset and teaching, you know, consistency and, and good habits. And I, I recommend that that book to, to anyone who's who's looking for something like that. For you, Ricardo, I mean, you you've always been consistent at at this one thing. Do you honestly feel like? And this is right. Like, let's let's be honest. What happens if TikTok goes down tomorrow? I don't. know. I think it's China, right? That was TikTok, whatever. Say TikTok, boom, disappear. Like MySpace did, right? Like if you're old enough to remember MySpace. One one day, my space just wasn't there anymore. Like, what happens if TikTok overnight, or maybe over the course of ninety days, just becomes non-existent, irrelevant? What happens to your to your credit repair company? I, I want to give you a, a quick answer in regards to what Gary V says. The currency, the new currency, is attention. Attention, right? Attention is the new currency. Right now, the biggest platform where the currency is at is on TikTok. If TikTok was eliminated, right? Assuming that I'm going to use the same business model. If TikTok is eliminated, that means that eyes of viewers are going to be somewhere else. They're going to be looking to be entertained somewhere else. My job is to create consistent content. That way those eyes are entertained, you know? So if, because we've come across this, we're like, wait, what if TikTok goes down? Or what if our account is banned? Or what if this, or what if that? You don't really ever know what your move is going to be until you actually get there. You can only prepare for certain scenarios, right? I'll tell you this, okay? Right now, our Instagram account, my personal Instagram account is about 109,000 followers, right? I think you know, bro, that in order to grow on Instagram, it's like, I don't know, it's nearly impossible, I guess. (laughs) Crazy. But TikTok banned me one day. And I freaked out. I lost my, I lost it, bro. I was like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Because I was the type of person that in, in a single hour, I can book 120 appointments. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I would like dare myself to do 10 more. Tomorrow yeah. I'm going to do 10 more than 120, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So then I, I got banned one day and I was like, oh my gosh, like I've been putting my soul focus in just one place, my all my eggs in one basket. And I was like, okay, I'm going to start creating over here now. Everything that I learned, I started applying in another space. Started growing, started growing, and started growing, and started growing. It's like, oh my gosh! Before I knew it, I hit over a hundred thousand followers. I was like, dang it, bro! You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's one of those things where, like, if you're looking for attention and if you know how to deliver valuable content, you're gonna get it. Doesn't matter where the eyeballs are; the eyeballs are gonna be somewhere, right? So if the eyeballs are no longer on TikTok, maybe they migrated to Instagram, maybe they migrated to YouTube Shorts, but. They're going to be somewhere and it's about being 
omnipresent is what it comes down to, right? Yeah, being on top of mind. I mean, if your favorite restaurant closed today, but you're out and about driving and you're hungry, you're gonna look for somewhere to stop by and eat, right? Yeah. Um, what do you What do you wish you know now? Like, what do you wish you knew then? Look, when you were the early stages of your credit repair company, maybe just getting started. Um, what do you wish you knew then that you know now? Like, if you could look back and say, Ricardo, do it. Like, what what would that be? <laughs> I I think honestly, man, like that. Not every up is ever it's always going to be there right you're not always going to be the uh, riding the big wave sometimes the wave crashes right and then you gotta because when you when you're down you you're thinking game, it's game over man it's like well, how did i get here right and either you were thinking like hey this is it or no i, I can get through this you know what i mean so i've had a few of those in my career so far uh, in the last four years that I've been doing this, you know, some ups, some downs, some ups, some downs. But interestingly enough, every time you're down, it forces you to get out of the comfort zone because everything is a comfort zone. Yeah. You know, everything is a comfort zone. I got comfortable making 120 appointments a day, you know, and when, when TikTok, TikTok's organic traffic came down because now money's being pumped into the system, it's like, what do I do now? Is this, is my business structure now going to die? Like, it, it, it's like digging through those things. It forces you to do something different. It takes you out of the comfort zone. So if I could go back and tell myself like, hey, bro, like you need to know this. It's going to be one of those things like business is always going to be up and down. You know, that's why businesses die and others survive. That's good. What advice would you have for someone who's looking to start a credit repair company? You have to be very daring. You can't give it 99%. You got to give it 120 you got to do things that you've never done in your life before, you know, and you got to be persistent because if you're not getting clients, it's because you haven't built something that's worthy enough to get clients yet. Perhaps you don't know how to make noise for it yet. Perhaps you don't know how to attract people, become the attractive character. If you have a bunch of excuses as to why you're not getting clients, well, that's perhaps what's holding you back. Yeah. Nobody cares, right? Nobody cares about your excuses. Nobody cares about your actions. Yeah. Even if I complain, nobody cares, man. Yeah. Do you know that... Um, <laughs> You know, we work with with a lot of credit repair companies, right? The, with with credit repair junkies being a service provider to credit repair businesses, we see hundreds of credit repair companies like every single month that we talk to. And what we've realized is that most credit repair companies, most business owners who start a credit repair company, they're no longer in business after three to six months. Like the lifespan of a credit repair company, we we joke entirely. We say it's like the lifespan of a fruit fly. <laughs> like you start the business because you're all excited, you're all hyped because you get sold a dream or whatever it is. But within three to six months, they're gone. They're gone. They give up. And entrepreneurship isn't for everybody, right? Let's just say that. Being a business owner is not for everybody. It's not like, oh, I was born for this. Everybody was born for this. No, it requires skill sets that a person may or may not have. And also preference, right? Like, you know what? Having a high paying job in corporate America, that's a dream for a lot of people, right? Entrepreneurship isn't a dream that should be for everyone. Being an entrepreneur isn't as easy as it as it's made to see it to be. Like people look at other people's success and they only see the success. They don't see, you know, the fire, the spikes, the the the, the drops, the valleys that we had to walk to get there. And it requires a really special type of person to be able to stick through that. So I believe that that's why, and it's not only the credit repair industry. I think if I was to look at the statistics of probably any type of business, within a year, probably most businesses are failing simply because, not because the business idea isn't isn't um, correct or isn't a good business idea. It's simply because the execution wasn't there to make it succeed. And in the credit repair space, more than anything else, execution and consistency in execution is how you succeed in this industry, right? It's not about, oh, I can get all the, you know, I can get the repossessions off. I get the bankruptcies off. I get the late payments. Off. Yeah, that's great. That's a service. Like you are a business owner who happens to provide this credit repair service. You can be great at credit repair and you can suck at being a business owner. Guess what? Your business ain't going to grow. You're better off working for a credit repair business and take your skills there, right? Now you can be somewhat okay at providing credit repair services, 
but be a stellar business owner, a stellar entrepreneur, guess what? Your business is going to make it because it's about you, how you run, operate, manage, grow your business. The getting the deletions off, yeah, that's a service, but what is the business, you know? And I think that that's where most credit repair companies fail is because they focus too much on doing credit repair and not enough on how can I become a real business owner who knows how to run, operate, and grow a business. I think that there's a lot of people that um, just think that in order for you to be the the best, you you work to be the best itself at, at, at the craft, right, of doing the service. But there's a lot of people that don't know how to market themselves. I mean, think about it. Like if we're in a red ocean, right, and you're and you're, you just have a service, right, and there's thousands of credit repair companies, you know, within a 500 mile radius, you know, you're in competition with all the other people right? How do you stand out in a red ocean? Like people open up shop and they're like, hey, I'm here. They don't even make a splash. I mean, I open the doors, you know, but in reality, it's through your, what, well, you know, this, this topic, your attractive character, you know, there's people that are going to re resonate with Bruce and there's people that are going to resonate with Ricardo and they're going to trust Ricardo or there's people that are going to trust Bruce. And then they choose based on trust, they're going to hand you their credit card. Based on trust, they're going to bring people. You know, the crazy part about doing this on TikTok or on social media is that you develop followers and you develop diehard fans. I have people that I've never met in my life that don't even live in California that will go out and defend me when I have a hater on my TikTok live. And it's crazy because these people are like, okay, I, I feel like I can trust you because you're defending me. Let me make you my moderator. So then they'll go every, every day, bro. They'll take time off of their life. And they'll go on their phone and they'll ping comments during my TikTok live, or they'll block haters, or they'll answer questions. And we're talking about men and we're talking about women. Yeah. You know, that's awesome. And you know, you, you hit it. It's trust. They trust you enough. Like these strangers trust you and people do business with who they know, like, and trust at the end of the day. I don't care what you're selling. People always buy people first. Yeah. People always buy people first. Because here's the thing. You can have the best thing in the world since sliced bread. But if I don't like you, I ain't getting it from you. I'm going to go get it somewhere else. Right? And especially when it comes to credit repair and finances and like this thing that's so personal. If I don't like you, I'm not going to hire you. The mistake that I see people make is that they get on a phone consultation and they try to sell credit repair. It's like, No. Sell yourself. You don't you don't start selling credit repair until you sold yourself first because they are not gonna buy until they buy into you first. And I think that's why you do the lives, right? Like you do your lives on TikTok because you're trying to get people to buy into you, into your story, into your personality, into your expertise. Your content develops that that trust so that people buy you. And now you can sell them anything, right? You can sell them your wife's hot sauce and they're gonna buy it because they trust you. The formula is really simple. The formula for me to acquire leads is very simple. If you've ever read the book from Gary V, um, by the way, he was like, during this whole process of like quitting the dealership, Gary V was my dude. It was like, my wife got me his shoes for, for my birthday, you know, because he, he brought back case with, right? Yeah, he did. So <laughs> I, I got the Gary V shoes and everything uh, during that time. And there was this book he came out with called um, Jab, 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 Right Hook right? Which is like, give, 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 and then ask, right? So when you say like, how do you stay so consistent? That was the formula. Give, 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 give. And then eventually I started asking. There's times where I don't even have to ask. People are just like, take my money, you know? And Alex Ramosi says it a little bit different. He says, give until they ask. Yeah. Because that's how you'll know you've earned the right. You've earned the trust when they ask. Right. If you're asking before, you know, would you ask your wife to marry you? And she would say yes after your first date? Probably not. I mean, I she'd mean, be you're... crazy not to, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, like David Beckman, The Rock or, you know, Vin Diesel, like you, you they got to get to know you before yeah. they, they commit to you. Right. So right. that's the thing, like earn your audience's trust, whether wherever they're coming from, just know that give until they ask sell yourself first. And that's how you grow a business. There's no, there's no wrong way of doing it. 
everybody's different. Everybody's personality is so different. It's what you said. Some people are going to resonate with, with Bruce. Some people are going to resonate with Ricardo. Some people are going to resonate with Johnny, right? And there's enough business for everybody. God knows there is enough bad credit in our country to where every credit repair con- company can make billions of dollars a year to help these consumers, right? So there's definitely enough for for, for everybody to, to get some. At the end of the day, like... For for the people that are either starting their credit repair company or they're in the trenches right now already, but we're just trying to find out more in regards of how to get more leads. You know, I, I mean, I, I doubled down on TikTok on short form content. That's my thing. It doesn't matter the 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 media type that you use, whether it's TikTok, whether it's Facebook posts, or whether it's a billboard. What allows me to sell in the way that I sell myself is by talking about my shortcomings. People want to know that you're human, just like That's them. Good. That's good. So when I talk about my bankruptcy, when I talk about my pops, when I talk about me being promoted to customer, when I talk about my repossessions, when I talk about the apartment, people resonate with that. They're like, damn, Bricard, like that's what I'm going through. Yeah. You know? and, and when I ask, because I, bro, like I put my audience on the spot. I tell them, how many people have realized that you're not only hurting yourself with your bad credit, but every single financial decision that you've made over the last seven years are hurting the people that you love in your household because you are removing opportunities in this lifetime for them because of your decisions. You you want to know what my my secret weapon is, bro? Tell me. With the way that I get my appointments, I tell them, I want you to grab your phone right now. And I want you to go to the text messages and think about the people that loves you the most, think about the people that the one person you love the most that has been hurting because of the lack of opportunities due to your credit or to your finances. Now, I want you to text them. I love you. I'm going to change things around for us. You hit the send button and you come back to my TikTok live and you write the word send in the comments. Let's see who's courageous enough to take a leap of faith here. You challenge them. Oh yeah. And you encourage them. That's awesome. Oh dude. yeah. That's the sauce right there, man. That's, that's, that's a gold nugget. That's a gold nugget because it works, but only after, because they're only going to do it if they care about anything that you're saying in the first place. Oh yeah. Because yeah. they you trust you. Trust first, man. You got to build the trust. And then I asked the magic question, which is, now let me ask you guys this. How many of y'all love, would love to partner up with my team and I and work one-on-one with you guys? Beautiful. There it is. That's why you've grown your business to, to the successful business that it is today. That's one way of doing it for sure, man. That's one way of doing it for sure. And and I applaud your efforts, man. That's it. And it's it's hard work. It sounds like hard work. It doesn't sound easy to go alive on TikTok every day or to post multiple times a day. Like I don't do that. I can't imagine. Like I don't have the bandwidth in my in my in my brain or in my my energy to do that. You know. So I applaud you because it's not easy work. You know, I always tell people credit repair is my vehicle. My passion is teaching. Uh-huh. I love when people have that aha moment. Yeah. That's, that's like a natural high for me. If I'm able to provide that aha moment for you, I know I'm doing something right in life. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's not hard for me to do it, you know? Plus we've been able to grow a business like that just for taking one, one hour a day, one hour and a half a day to do this, to educate people out there. And here's the crazy part, bro. There's people that are out there and you know, if you got, if you got hated, you ain't making enough noise. That's for sure. That's true. That's true. But there's people that will that will not sign up for my service. They'll come back. They'll be like, because of you, I went from a 400 to a 700 in X amount of time. Because of your advice, I got this. Because of your advice, I'm now a homeowner. They were never my client, but they are my high, they're my diehard fans now. Which is good. You get clients because of your diehard fans. Either way, it's a win-win for you. Uh-huh. It's a great story. Before you wrap up, you like put me on the spot. Do you have any questions you'd like to ask me? I do have one question for you, man. You got multiple businesses going on. And sometimes I feel like even our viewers don't appreciate the things that we do for them. Out of all of your businesses that you're taking time away from to do this podcast, out of your family, out of all of out of you resting, because I you know, I I know your back is in, in pain right now and everything. Why do you do what you do? Why do you put out content for people for free? Why do you do this podcast? Why do you say, Ricardo, like, let's do a podcast, bro? I'm glad you asked that question because it's funny. Like, I think whenever we record these episodes, my wife takes the kids and she goes out. She goes to the park. She goes somewhere. 
because I don't want their yelling in the background to come, you know, on these episodes or them stomping upstairs and jumping to kind of come through. And the reason for all of this is because I'm passionate about what I do. I love what I do. You know, I don't do this because I expect to, to make millions from it, right? I do this because I'm literally passionate about the credit repair service, the credit repair industry, because I know it really does change lives. It changed your life. It changed my life. And it changes thousands and thousands and thousands of people's lives every single day, every single year. So to be able to be a part of that, like I love her. Like I, I put my head down on my pillow at night to go to bed. And man, I sleep like a baby every single night because I know that although I am making money and feeding my family from this, more importantly, I'm helping somebody achieve their dreams, right? I'm helping somebody become a homeowner who they never would have become a homeowner unless I was able to help them fix their credit, right? I'm helping them get that, that dream car. I'm helping them get that job. I'm helping the military people get their security clearance because their credit is now fixed. So there is a, a, there's a bigger purpose in all of this. So the reason why I do the podcast, the reason why I do the, the trainings and all the things that I do, simply because I love the industry. I'm passionate about it. Like This doesn't feel like work to me. This brings me joy. To be able to sit here and have a conversation with a friend that someone else is eventually going to hear that's going to help them, it's all worth it to me. Right? Like, Did I pay you to be on here? No. So why are you on here? Same thing, man. You know Same what? Same thing. It's not about me right now. It's all about you, bro. <laughs> but all I'm trying to do is follow your lead on finding out a way how to serve people at the highest level possible. I'm, servant leadership for me is one of those those things. And I bring that into my business. Um, if you speak to, to, to our employees and to our clients, they feel served. Because if not, then I feel like I failed them. And there's only one, for me, there's one way, the right way to do this is if you go in, for the passion, you go in because you're trying to help people, and that's the way to do it. Because if you go in for the money, you're only going to do it for so long, because people are going to they're going to smell your crap from a mile away, and they're going to know that you're only after their money. Now, when they feel and they sense the passion for me and for my entire team, they know that we're in the trenches with them, and we're not giving up until we're done. Right? So, passion is what keeps this thing going and rolling. That's the reason why after I sold my company, I started again. Because I, I was lost, like, okay, what, what do I do now? No, like, let's start over and let's do this whole thing again because I don't see myself doing anything else other than fixing credit. And for as long as credit is going to be needing to be fixed, I'm going to be there doing it. In one way, shape, or another form or another, I'm going to be there doing it. Yeah. You know, you you said something in your in your um, chat during the Smart Credit Conference when you were up on stage. You said something in regards of, if you're doing this for the money, you're not going to get far. I want to make sure that people understand that. There's times where I've tried creating content because I'm like, oh my gosh, my sales are slow. Let me create content to generate sales. The worst flops ever. <laughs> but I'm like, when I have like this wow moment, I'm like, oh, okay, this person learned from this video. Let me recreate this video again because it actually helped people. That's when I have my biggest sales times. That's awesome. Yeah, that's how it works. I appreciate you, brother. And you know what? For, for whoever's listening to this podcast, whoever's watching this podcast right now, should be graceful. They have people like Bruce doing these things that no one's paying him for it. You know, they're doing it out of the goodness of their heart because of the fact that they're trying to at least change one person's life, whoever listens and whoever takes action. So thanks so much for what you do, brother. I appreciate, I really appreciate that, it. I appreciate you for, for agreeing to come on this journey with me. If any of our listeners or viewers wants to connect with you, is there a way they can connect with you or find you? I've never changed my Instagram name or my uh, TikTok name. You could always find me with thatguy.ricardo, like thatguy.ricardo. Ironically speaking, I, I don't know why or how this happened, but a lot of people in the credit repair space are now that guy something, that guy that, that guy oh, this. Really? And no, I was like, they're modeling yeah. what works, clearly. Like this guy has 400,000 yeah, followers. Be. I'm going to be that guy, Bruce. <laughs> yeah, there you go, man. Yeah. I wish I could show you. You know what? I'm going to take a picture and I'm going to send it to you. That way you could actually see my background. I got this like really cool sign made. My wife was like, you should have a sign made with your name, with all, your social media name. I'm like, all right, I'll do it. So yeah, man. But thank you so much for having me in the podcast, brother. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. For sure, brother. I appreciate you. And for all of our listeners, we'll catch you on the next one. Take care.